Hi everyone and welcome to this full length tutorial showing you how I build up long fur in pastel. Now if you're just watching this on YouTube, uh, you should know that I have two other parts in this series. This is actually part three. So the guys over on my Patreon channel have already watched parts one and two, which deal with the other lengths of fur on this same face. So throughout the whole series, you'll get a full build up of this particular dog. But I thought I would release this part as a little bonus to you guys on YouTube as well, and to show you a little bit of what my tutorials are actually like on Patreon. So I hope you enjoy this and you find it helpful. Please do subscribe here on YouTube if you haven't already. And also check out the links in the description if you're interested in further in-depth tutorials on my Patreon channel. Enjoy the video. So you can see that I have a lot of work done already on this piece. But that fur towards the bottom of the dog, down the chest and under the chin, is very different from the rest of the fur on the dog. This one dog provided me with so many opportunities to demo different lengths of fur. And another part in this series shows you all that really short fur on the muzzle. But in this part, we're just going to focus on the bottom part of the painting. And I'm going to show you how I build up what looks like quite a complicated area of uh, longer fur. So like with the previous parts and with everything I do, I'm always working from dark to light where possible. And so I come in with my dark colours first and I use those to sort of plot the path. If I don't lay down those dark colours early on, then I'll really have no depth to my fur later on when I start to add the highlights. So I'm using Unison Colour Pastels, my absolute favourite brand of pastels, although I do use a range of different brands, but you'll see me pick up the Unisons quite often. And in my tutorials, I always share those colour codes down in the bottom left corner. And it's not really so that you have to go and get the same colours, but I think it's useful to show you exactly what colour I'm using so that you can perhaps substitute for a colour that you have that's close to it. So I'm using this lovely, warm, rich brown just to plot where that fur comes round the chest you can see at this bottom corner, we just get a little glimpse of where it gets darker. And the marks that I'm making at this stage aren't particularly neat. It doesn't matter too much as long as I make the mark in the general direction of the fur at this stage. That's really helpful at this stage if you can make your first marks start to get a bit of the texture of the fur. So I'm just looking at the way that longer fur sweeps down from under the chin. And this is pastel matte paper that I'm working on. Normally, for a lot of my pet portraits, I'm often working on Hanamul velour paper. But recently, I've started to really enjoy the extra detail that I can get on pastel mat. And it's not that I'm always going for extra detail. I'm not really that hung up on getting every single hair in the right place. And with this piece, I really tried to introduce uh, lots of vibrant colors through the fur. And believe it or not, I did try to keep it a little looser than the previous pieces that I've done on pastel mat. I find on pastel mat I can get very fiddly very quick. It makes me want to pick up the pastel pencils too soon. So with this piece I was really trying to hold back on the use of pencil just using those bigger sticks that give me that lovely rich uh, pigmented colour on the paper. And if you've watched some of my videos, you'll see me use this particular black quite often. This is a black Faber-Castell stick. 
So it's a little bit harder than the Unison's. But it's a really, really jet black colour. And I love how it goes on to any paper that I've used it on. So I, I use this as my darkest black value in most of my paintings. And if you're scared to go too dark, especially on these uh, first layers of your painting, you will find that you'll have very little contrast towards the end. If you don't come in pretty dark in the start, especially with a coat like this, then you'll find that you won't get much definition in the fur later on when you start to come in with your lighter colours. So try to be brave with your colour choices. Try to be brave in those first layers that you put down. Remembering that the colours you add later on will go over the top of those darker colours. Pastel is such a wonderful medium for being able to layer up your colours gradually. So unless it's a really dark area like the section I'm creating at the moment, most of the time I'm putting the pastel quite thinly on the paper. I'm not leaning too heavily. I don't want to fill the grain or the tooth of the paper. I want to make sure that I've got lots of space left in the tooth of the paper for my next layers. So the key thing is just build it up gradually, use quite a light touch, don't lean too heavily. I think a lot of people encountering problems with soft pastel, it's mostly to do with filling up the tooth of the paper too soon. And I'm also rubbing most of the pastel into the paper slightly, especially on these lower layers. I don't want to leave the pastel sitting loose on the surface of the paper. I want it to really blend into the paper so that it will accept many more layers of pastel. But I'm just trying to follow the green of the fur it sweeps out so beautifully from especially this left side. And it does look like I'm going rather dark at this stage. But when you look in between all of those lighter hairs, you need to look for the darker colours that you can see in there. You need those colours down first so that they can shine through your lighter fur later on. So that's really key in pastel. These early layers are really important at getting the basis of your painting down and creating that lovely contrast that you're hoping for by the end. So many, many different browns in this particular piece. I've also used some really vibrant oranges, a very bright red, some green, believe it or not. So I'm always looking for colours in there that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see. I'm really trying to push the colour values. By the time I blend things together and add more layers, sometimes those vibrant colours get knocked back a little. So in these early layers, I'm always trying to choose some of the livelier colours, knowing that they'll tone down later on in the process. So I'm on to mid-tone colours now, starting to fill in some of those gaps. I don't want to go too bright too soon. I really want to build up the colours gradually, 
from dark to light. And the more steps you can create in there, the thicker and more realistic your fur will seem. I think a lot of the time, well, what I hear from my patrons anyway, is that most people don't realize just how long you need to spend to build up something uh, realistically when you're dealing with fur that's as thick as this. So the key really is to have patience, build it up gradually. And I keep hearing all the time from my patrons uh, just how surprised they are at how much patience I have and it makes them realize that they need to take their time more, spend longer on it, not trying to rush to get to the end product. If I feel myself starting to get a bit frustrated or impatient, then I'll just leave the painting, I won't paint anymore, or I'll move to another part of the painting and work on that for a while. But I really do try to slow the process down and take my time, really consider my marks. But that's not quite so laborious as it sounds, especially when it's something that I really enjoy painting. So fur to me is like a day off. I love creating fur. Give me a, a thick area of undergrowth with lots of leaves and flowers and grass. That feels like work to me. But this is a subject matter that I'm really comfortable working on. I love painting fur. So I had a lot of fun on this particular piece. It was a beautiful photo reference to work from. There aren't even any ears to add in. It was just big face close-up crop and I loved that. It just gave me uh, so much license to play around with the fur effects. So all my favourite things to paint in one piece. Lots of fur, some beautiful eyes and a big shiny nose. Perfect. So although I work dark to light, it's not always strictly the rule because quite often I come back in with my darkest values again. So it goes back and forth a little bit. But I'm constantly coming back in with the dark values just to ensure that I have enough depth, enough darkness in there. And I know that there are a lot of painters who are of the school of thinking that you shouldn't really use black or white when you're painting. If you'd like to hear more of my thoughts on that, because you can see here that I'm using a lot of black in this piece, uh, do check out, I have a video on my YouTube channel all about whether you should use black or white in your painting. And I explain that rule there a little better. But you can see that I'm certainly not scared to use black in a painting, especially like this, where I really need to create some absolutely jet black areas in the darkest of creases. You'll see, though, that a lot of the time I do break up those dark areas with other colours. But initially, I really like to get that depth in there with the Faber-Castell black stick. So with my 
groundwork done in those lower layers. The fun can really start now when I start to fill in some of those gaps with my mid-tones and start to think a little more about creating the texture of the hairs. So you can see on this type of long fur, you've got a little bit of a, a wave to each hair. Several breeds of dogs have this type of hair. Uh, my biggest challenge with this type of fur in a dog breed has been the chow chow, which has hair like uh, twizzly little fine hairs all over. And by the end of painting that type of breed, my arm is usually sore from having to create a little waver in each of my marks. So that's what I'm doing, especially on the top layers on fur like this trying to not make the marks too smooth and straight, creating a little bit of a weave or weaver in my mark to replicate how that fur behaves. And I love the contrast between this area and the dark area just to the left. It's such a nice area of the painting, this. So again, just sticking with my mid-tones. Starting to think about how that fur sprouts out from underneath the chin. and how it flows down to the bottom of the piece. Again, I'm still in pretty early stages here, so I'm not too concerned about the accuracy of every single mark. Really, my most important marks come with the top layers. So I'm still trying to fill in some of the paper here. You can see I've still got a lot of gaps on the paper. I know a lot of artists who will put a ground uh, colour right across the paper to begin with, just to get uh, some pastel onto the paper. Pastel papers tend to really only start to come into their own when you get a couple of layers of pastel on there so you can really start to move things around and um, it's really nice for adding new layers on top once you've got a couple of layers of pastel on there. But I don't tend to cover the whole paper in one go with one block colour. Um, I, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, it gets a good base colour down for you to start with. I just prefer this method of using every single layer of pastel available to me on the paper to create the texture and the direction of the fur. So from my early marks I'm always thinking about the structure of the animal and it's often the flow of the fur that describes that structure so even from my early layers I'm trying to plot that out so that I can get the anatomy to look right under there. So the flow of the fur on an animal is so important. It shows the muscular structure. Even when you can't see any of that under thick fur, it's the flow of the fur that will give accuracy to the animal's anatomy. So I'm already starting to come in with some lighter tones on this side of the piece. What I find most interesting about this photo reference is the fact that it's lit from one side. So you get that lovely side lighting effect and you get shadows on the right side of the dog and some lovely highlights over on this left side. And that makes for a really good photo reference to paint from. 
If you're looking for good photos to practice painting, try and go for ones that have good natural lighting and especially ones that have good side lighting like this as it gives you lovely light and shade. If you can capture that in the painting, you'll get a real 3D appearance. Your piece will really seem to pop. And the main way to capture that type of lighting is in your colour choices. So I'm always yapping on about colour choices every tutorial I make, but it's so important. And in parts one and two of this series where I'm dealing with the fur at the top of the dog and on the muzzle of the dog, I go into a lot of detail describing why I'm using certain colours in certain places. And it's really your colour theory that's going to boost your work into realism and give it a real 3D quality. If you think about the Impressionists' work, quite often they didn't go for crisp detail. They didn't bother painting every single little thing that they could see. Yet, when you stand back from a good Impressionist painting, like across the room from it, it can appear like a photograph. So why is that when they put so little detail into their work? How can it still appear uh, photographic when you're at a distance from it? And that's solely down to colour choice. If you choose the right uh, tones for the painting in the, in the right places to describe light and shadow, no matter how messy your edges are or how little detail you put in there, you'll still create something that is a convincing 3D image. And it's really the Impressionist's work that I learned so much about colour theory. I've looked at colour wheels my whole life during my art education and I've never really understood what it all meant, why there was importance to one colour being opposite to another colour. And it really took uh, many years later uh, of looking at the Impressionists' work before the penny finally dropped. And ever since then, it's really transformed my work. Learning about colour theory is possibly the one uh, thing that has transformed my work for the better over the years, the biggest thing that has made the most improvement to my work. So I highly recommend that you look into some colour theory. Uh, check out my own video here on colour theory on YouTube. And just as I mentioned colour theory, you see me come in with some green in amongst the fur over on this shadow side. And it seems an unusual colour choice, but I'm using a lot of red a lot of rich reds throughout the coat. And to describe some little areas where it's a bit cooler, I brought in some green as its opposite colour. And just knowing a little bit about colour theory will help you make decisions like that that really enhance your work and bring you closer to the realm of realism, if that's what you're going for. But as I said, colour theory is an important thing to learn about for anyone, whether you're wanting to paint realistically or not. In fact, even more so if you're not painting realistically. Uh, sometimes colour theory is the whole reason why a painting might work. So if that's an area that you haven't looked into very much, like myself when I was first starting out, I didn't really know a lot about that. I'll add some links in my description below if you'd like to see uh, my video that goes into quite a lot of detail about colour theory. Uh, do check out the links in the description below this video. So it really is the coat of many colours. 
It's also quite a big piece, this, at uh, 12 by 16. It's quite big for just a head portrait. So I gave myself lots of space for as much detail as possible here. And she's such a beautiful dog as well. I was so pleased to get this commission in my book. Sometimes a commission that's coming up just fills you with joy. Sometimes they can fill you with dread, but this one I was looking forward to for ages. If you'd like to have a go at painting Freya, uh, also on my Patreon channel, I provide the reference photos to work along with me. I also give you a gridded version, a line drawing version, so that you can skip the drawing part and get straight to learning how to pastel. So with all of my tutorials over on Patreon you can find the reference photos so that you can have a go too. And each month I also provide other reference photos. So for the month that we were dealing with German Shepherd fur I provided the patrons with a lot of other photo reference of different types of dogs with the similar fur. That's one of the things that's, well it used to be quite difficult as an artist learning, um, just getting hold of good photo reference that's uh, good to paint from. These days it's not so difficult. There are so many sites which offer royalty free images. Do be sure that you either go for an image that's royalty free, copyright free, or if it's not, make sure you always contact the photographer, ask for their permission. Quite often I will pay a photographer for use of their image. They're artists just like us trying to earn a living, so always try to respect the copyright laws. However, the best way to get around those copyright issues is to try and take photo reference yourself. I'm always trying to work from my own photo references. Obviously, when I'm given a commission, especially when the person might live on the other side of the world from me, it's not always possible for me to gather my own photo reference. And a photograph like this certainly isn't one that I'm going to turn down just because it's not my own photo reference. So I'm quite happy to take on commissions and work from other people's photos. But I do find that I learn so much more when I start from the very beginning with composing the image through the camera lens, choosing what to include and what to crop out. I really love being a part of the process right from the beginning. So I always advise people to get out with their cameras, especially if you like painting animals. Sometimes the type of animal you like painting, if it's wild animals, maybe that makes it a little more difficult. But certainly if it's domestic animals or farm animals, Get yourself out there with a the little camera. You'll feel really satisfied by the end of a painting where you actually started the process by going out with a camera and capturing those initial bits of inspiration. So many, many layers later. I'm just starting to bring in some of the lighter colours. And now I'm really thinking about my marks. They matter a little bit more at this stage. I'm trying to get that little waver or that almost crimped effect. Do you remember the crimpers you used to get in the 1990s? <laughs> Don't know why anyone uh, destroyed their hair with crimpers. I think I'm guilty of it too. But 
Some dog breeds just have such naturally beautiful crimped fur. And I know I used to have a, a collie dog who, when you would get her out of the bath, when she was all wet, her hair just went crimped right over and it was so beautiful. But I wouldn't like to have to paint her when she was wet. So I'm literally just using a little bit of a shake in my hand to create those hairs. I don't have to do it for every single one. Just trying to be a bit looser with the hairs here. Start to gradiate some of those brighter hairs into the darker areas. But you can see that I'll be saving all my brightest colours for this left side of the piece. This is where the light source is coming from. And that area over on the right is such a different colour to on the left. So I'm always very careful to save the highlights that I use on the brightest area of the dog. and not let any of those brightest highlights creep over onto the shadow parts. And again, little touches of green there. It's nice when you see it in amongst those rich reds. But I'm always looking for ways that I can introduce a little bit of um, opposite colour theory into my work as it really does make that 3D effect pop. And those lovely unison pastels, I love how they break down into smaller pieces. I'm not sure that I've actually picked up any pastel pencil in this particular part of the dog. Just using all of the unison pastels, my broken pieces are my most treasured pieces. I can always find a little sharp edge somewhere on the pastel. But I would have made use of pastel pencil in around the nose and the eyes, any places where I need some really precise detail. But I know that I enjoy the process so much more when I can just have those lovely fat pastel sticks. Believe it or not, I am not a huge fan of very small fiddly detail. I'm in my element when I'm painting a little more loosely, especially when that subject matter includes fur. So when I can just use my soft pastel sticks, I love it. I like getting messy hands. I like being able to smudge with my fingers. It just feels like a very hands-on tactile medium to work with. And with surprisingly fast results too, you can block in a lot of colour in one go. You can really work quite quickly with pastel, which is another reason that I love it. So if you're just starting out with soft pastel and you're finding it difficult to create small detail, of course you can combine them with pastel pencils. But do continue to work at your pastel skills. Break your pastels down to find sharp edges. It takes a while just to get a feel for them. But once you do, they're so enjoyable to use.
So I don't want those areas that are jet black to stop in too sharp a line before my highlight colours. Here I'm just trying to use some more shadowy tones to gradiate those lighter marks into the darkness. So it's almost as if they are looming out of the darkness towards us. So just starting to pick out some of those highlighted areas right under the chin. Taking my time with those marks. Again, trying to add that little bit of a shake to my marks. And for the next few moments, that's what you're going to see me do. Just going around picking out some of those highlighted areas now. We're getting close to the end. I've still got some of those most important highlights to add. And then I'll join back in when I'm doing something different towards the end, some of my finishing touches.
So we're close to the end now and for the first time you'll see me pick up pastel pencil. So the longer the fur is, probably the less pastel pencil I tend to use on it. But at this stage it's really useful for me just to come in, tweak some of those marks into place and refine some of the very small ends of the fur. So I usually make use of a small range of pastel pencils. But you can see that I don't get quite the same strength of pigment from the pencils as from my soft pastels. So I much prefer to put the soft pastels down first and then use a similar colour of pastel pencil just to tweak everything into place, create little fine flyaway ends to the hair. They're a great tool to use at this stage. I really tend to think of my full collection of tools a bit like a selection of uh, paint brushes of all different sizes, all pre-loaded with the exact colour that you need. So my bigger pastel sticks, those are big brushes. I can use the pastel stick on its side, like a big brush that you would use to cover in an entire canvas, right down to the fine point of these pencils, which is like a little paintbrush that Salvador Dali himself might have used with one hair on it. So I get the full range by incorporating all of those materials together and it gives me so much scope within this medium. So we're getting close to the end now. I hope that you've enjoyed this and that you've found it helpful. Maybe next time you've got a similar challenge some of these tips will hopefully help. My main tip is just to have lots and lots of patience. Take your time. Really study the photo reference that you're working from. But mainly, just take your time. And enjoy the process. Don't freak out when you're in those early stages and it looks a bit ugly. Even in those middle stages it can look a bit ugly. You just got to trust that with this type of medium that you build up gradually, that the end effect will all come together. So if you haven't already, please do subscribe to me here on YouTube. I aim to bring out as much free content for people as possible. I really love the idea of providing art education that's both affordable and sometimes free for those who can't afford to spend money on art education. So I love that I can bring uh, free content to my YouTube channel. But at the same time, the people who are making that possible are my patrons over on my Patreon channel as if I wasn't earning some money from somewhere making these videos, I just wouldn't be able to do it. So it's thanks to those guys on Patreon. And if you're interested in my full catalogue of these longer tutorials, do check out the link in the description below. You'll find a lot more content over on my Patreon channel. And as well as that, a delightful group of artists to be involved with. I've so enjoyed setting up the channel for them and also starting a Facebook group called the Dusty Forum where they all hang out and share their work in progress, um, any problems they're having. It's a great supportive group of artists who all help each other out with their shared experiences. But a huge thanks to Every one of you who have subscribed to me here on YouTube, your support here is equally as important as it really helps uh, spread the word about my channel and therefore be able to make more videos like this. 
Again, I hope you've enjoyed this. I'll leave you with the last minute or so of footage while I make some of my finishing touches. But until next time, thanks for watching and happy pastling.